Joining us now, Spike Cohen, Libertarian vice presidential candidate on the ticket in 2020. Good afternoon there, Spike. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Gerard. Thank you for having me on. You bet. So it's my understanding that uh, you're going to be in Tunica. Uh, is that next week? It's coming up pretty soon, isn't it? That's Actually, the, it's, uh, it's this coming weekend. I'm going to be in Tunica at the Horseshoe Resort and Casino, yeah. which is uh, we're doing the um, Breaking Boundaries for Liberty event uh, sponsored by the uh, M- Mississippi Libertarian Party. And uh, it's going to be me and a bunch of other really cool, dynamic libertarian speakers there. Uh, we're also, uh, sometime during the weekend, we're going to be doing a, uh, a protest at the, uh, at the Supreme Court over Initiative 65. Uh, a lot of really fun stuff we're going to be doing over the weekend. Uh, and if you want to find out more, go to slp.org. Yeah, so appreciate that uh, this weekend, yeah. Uh, all right, so let's jump into that, uh, Spike. Uh, I know you've got sure. uh, some strong views about uh, 65 and the recent Supreme Court ruling uh, striking down that uh, ballot initiative. Tell us your thoughts on that. Well, the problem is it didn't just strike down the ballot initiative. It, it struck down all ballot initiatives until the legislature moves forward on changing the wording of the of how the law is written. The, the problem here is the people of Mississippi, by a 74% margin, 74% of Mississippi people said that people who have child epilepsy, who have glaucoma, who have other ailments, that cannabis is the only effective and safe Uh, treatment for their illness, that they should be able to get that legally. The Supreme Court said not only is that not going to happen, but they looked at what should have been a common sense fix, which is, you know, for those who don't know what the actual decision was, they decided that because the way that it was written, it said that there had to be a certain number of votes, certain percentage of votes in all five congressional districts in Mississippi. Now that there are only four congressional districts, that that means that there can't be any uh, initiatives because there aren't enough congressional districts. It's as though the role of the judiciary is to apply the intent of the people who made the legislation in determining how it should be applied. So unless they have actual wording from the people that wrote it that said, we only want Mississippi to have the ability to have um, initiatives uh, on the ballot if you have five congressional districts, no more, no less, then there was no reason for them not to simply say, okay, what they meant was all of the congressional districts. There are only four of them. This met that uh, criteria. We're going to allow it to stand, and we're going to allow initiatives to continue. Instead, by making this decision, not only have they robbed Mississippians who need these treatments to be able to survive, but they've also robbed the entire state of Mississippi of the ability to be able to affect legislation to the initiative process. Yeah, and it's uh, you, you described it, uh, I believe, accurately, and it's something we've broken down and discussed, as you can imagine, extensively uh, on the program. Right. So what would you like to see happen here in Mississippi with respect to that? Do, do you support that the governor should call a special session to f- fix the initiative process, uh, perhaps get a medical marijuana a bill passed and enacted, or should they wait and sort this out in the next session, which would uh, uh, convene in 2022, early 2022? How, what do, would you I like think to considering the fact, yeah, I think especially considering the fact that this was overwhelmingly passed, and this is a, the initiative thing, it's not gonna matter again until next election cycle, uh, but the sooner it's dealt with, the better. I think a special session to simply pass a clean uh, uh, initiative, uh, some, a change to amendment to the initiative uh, legislation so that it just says all of the uh, congressional districts instead of five or having any static number on it so that this doesn't happen yeah. again in the future. Uh, but also just a clean medical uh, cannabis bill. I mean, the, the Libertarian Party recommends ending the war on drugs because we want to end the cartels. We want to end the drug gang violence. We want to end the corruption of, of uh, government and police departments that comes from the war on drugs, which was the same thing that happened during alcohol prohibition. But at the very least, the people voted for medical cannabis. They should get medical cannabis. Yeah. So, do you do you think the Supreme Court got it wrong? I mean, are, are you not happy about the Supreme Court's decision, and do you place the blame on them for Mississippi not having a medical marijuana program? 
Well, it, the blame is on them for them not having a, a program. I, I will say this. This wasn't judicial activism. This was a bad interpretation, in my mind anyway. Maybe maybe they had activist reasons behind it. Maybe they were against medical cannabis. But they didn't step in and go, well, we don't like medical cannabis, so therefore you're not going to have it. What they did was they, they like I said, the, the problem is they're applying a – they're, they're looking at a decision and their job is to decide what the intent was behind the legislation. And for some reason, they determined that the people who wrote this uh, uh, ballot initiative or wrote this legislation, this constitutional amendment back in, I think, what was it, 92 or something like that, that clearly mm -hmm. they only wanted the people of Mississippi to be able to vote on this if there was exactly five congressional districts in Mississippi, no more, no less, even though that, that number is constantly in flux in every state. Um, and based on that, they said, okay, so then there can't be any initiatives. I think that a much more common sense and, and understandable uh, um, interpretation of it would have been, well, clearly they meant that there should be you know, a, an equal number among all of however many congressional districts there are. They picked five because that's how many Mississippi had at the time. Um, you know, we hope to see that Mississippi uh, grows and develops in the future so that there are more than five congressional districts, maybe six or seven congressional districts, in which case this could become a problem again. Uh, so, yeah, the blame falls on them. But more importantly, the, the Supreme Court has decided this is what they're going to do. At this point, uh, it's up to the, uh, the governor and the legislature there to make the changes so that uh, the people of Mississippi can get the medical cannabis that they have voted for overwhelmingly and so that they get back their ability to be able to vote on initiatives in their state. Yeah. And there are several initiatives, as you know, that are waiting in the works, but are, are kind of just DOA yep. right now and, and hanging out on exactly. the line because there's really no, no mechanism uh, for them to, to get through. Uh, no process for right. it. So you know this lawsuit, of course, was filed by uh, a mayor, Madison Mayor, uh, Mary Hawkins, uh, Mary Hawkins Butler. Do, uh, or do you have any grievance with her for filing this lawsuit? Do you understand her concerns, and and do you take uh, I guess exception with those concerns? Uh, she she's the one that really initiated this. I really don't know much about why she initiated it. I know that they they used a procedural, you know, a standing saying that, well, the way that it's written, you can't implement it anymore. And right. the Supreme Court agreed with that. Um, I don't know what her actual concerns were behind that, but I can tell you this. And we've seen this over and over again. When you put prohibitions on a substance, on something that someone is choosing to put in their body, even something worse than cannabis. I mean, cannabis is... Is, is much less dangerous than even alcohol. Uh, you know, many thousands of people die a year from alcohol overdose. So far, no one has ever died of cannabis overdose. So we're talking about something safer. But even the harder drugs, when it is banned, it doesn't get rid of the demand for it. All it does was is move the supply into the black market. So now you are handing criminals and gang members and cartels this multi-billion dollar industry. This is literally what happened with prohibition. Everything that we're seeing with the war on drugs is what's happening now with, or what that happened with alcohol prohibition is now happening with all the other dr drug prohibition. You have cartels that are sprouting up around the world. They're becoming mega billionaires. They're paying off governments to, to look the other way, which is causing more corruption in government. Uh, they're taking over entire countries and in, and in our country, entire communities with gang violence to fight over drug turf. If you simply made it so that these drugs, even some of the more dangerous ones, were able to be legally and safely bought either in stores or online, you get rid of the gang violence. You get rid of the uh, you get rid of the cartels, and now you can treat drug addiction like a health problem, the same that we do with alcohol. Instead of a criminal problem, we treat it like a health problem. Addictions go down, overdoses go down, crime goes down, corruption goes down, and we do that by simply getting government out of the lives of everyday people. Well, I certainly agree with this. Uh, I think you and I w are aligned uh, in this regard, is that as long as people want to put this stuff in their body, they're going to figure out a way to get it, and somebody's going to sell it to right. them. It's just simple as that. Yeah. Now, I think it, just to be uh, uh, fair to the mayor here, uh, or, or really kind of, uh, I guess, expose her side and disclose her side, okay. I think her concern was that the, the way the, the law 65 was written, uh, there was no... 
um, sort of local ability to opt out of participating in the program, to have uh, what we what the law calls treatment centers located, and I, I also think there's no limit to the number uh, that could uh, be established in the state or in a locale, and I think that's where. Uh, she primarily had concerns that she wanted. If she wanted to opt her city out, and her constituents wanted to opt out of it, she didn't have the right to do that or the authority to do that under the law. That was a concern. But that's uh, that's typically how the free market works, where government I, can't stop people from consuming something if they want to. Spike, I'll get uh, your reaction to that and much more on the other side of a break. If you can stay with us, absolutely. Spike Cohen, Libertarian VP candidate in 2020, is our guest. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Spike Cohen, Libertarian uh, VP candidate in 2020, is our guest on the program. So, Spike, I was just sharing with you kind of where I think the mayor of Madison, and I don't think she was alone in, in her position, which is that they wanted to have some degree of control over uh, zoning, uh, really not just of of so-called dispensaries and treatment centers that would uh, engage in the business of selling retailing medical marijuana. But, uh, you know, that zoning is, is kind of a, a, a common thing that is uh, typically um, under the purview of state, or excuse me, local municipal governments. And they just felt like that, she felt like, as well as other mayors, that this was sort of being crammed down their throat. You don't have a choice in this matter. Uh, you, you can't block this. You can't zone. The, these shops can be anywhere or very limited, I guess, the way the law was written. That was the primary grievance. I haven't heard any of them specifically say, well, I oppose medical marijuana as a concept and the legalization of medical marijuana. So do you have uh, some particular issue with, I guess, municipal zoning? I, I know you said before we went to break that that's where the free market kind of uh, takes care of that situation. But we got the Biden administration, for example, that's, that's seeking to completely outlaw single-family homes. You know, they want, they want to do away with well, that see, and that, that's, that's, that's going the other way. That's, using, that's yeah. weaponizing zoning to force things that zoning often is used to force not happening, that neither yeah. of those is, the, is the, the, the ideal solution there. Specific to this when it comes to medical marijuana, I don't know enough about what the particulars were for how the zoning could be done and things like that to be able to weigh in on that. In general, I would imagine, though, if it is if it is a zone for commercial use uh, or for uh, medical use, and again, I'm not sure how your zoning works in Mississippi if you actually have specific zoning for uh, medical applications or if it just falls under general commercial. But if it's basically if it were zoned the same where you could have a physical therapy center or a doctor's office or any other kind of medical thing or for that matter any other kind of commercial thing, I, I don't see why having a dispensary uh, or a treatment center uh, would be an issue. Again, this isn't, you know, um, this isn't uh, some, you know, like a, a crack house or something like that. This is cannabis to be used to treat children that have epilepsy or to treat people who have glaucoma or to treat people uh, who are having severe side effects from chemotherapy and aren't able to eat. Uh, it's medicine. Um, mm. So I understand there's still some st unfortunate stigma from the reefer madness days about cannabis, but the reality is cannabis is a very safe uh, uh, drug that can, can be used recreationally, but can also just be used uh, medically. And, and to give a little bit of background about myself, I've been sober for 15 years. Um, and I don't think getting intoxicated on anything, even alcohol, is a good idea. I don't even drink coffee or, or, or sodas. Uh, I live a very, very, very clean lifestyle. I don't believe that my personal decision should be imposed on others, especially on something like this. That is a medical issue. This is medical treatment for ailments that either can't be solved with other treatments or can't be solved as effectively or safely with other treatments. And I, I'm not sure why there would be a need to uh, let anyone except for the market limit or dictate what kind of demand there is for that. Right. So one of our, our listeners, this is Mike in Gulfport, he says, where does Spike get the idea that legalized weed would lead to medical treatment and reduction of addiction? 
Uh, well, we can tell, we can ask Portugal. So in Portugal, they actually legalized or they decriminalized all their drugs. Uh, Portugal yeah. at one point had the highest rates of overdose, addiction, murder, gang violence, every single metric. They were worse than any other country in Europe. And then after years of just ratcheting up their war on drugs over and over again, finally they thought, you know what, let's try a different way where they literally decriminalized all of the drugs from the hardest stuff all the way down to cannabis, uh, because again, cannabis is safer than, than alcohol is. Uh, they, they decriminalized everything. They allowed uh, usage of it. They even allowed some small scale distribution of it. Uh, and people who wanted to could get treatment instead of being thrown in jail for it. And now Portugal has the lowest rates of overdose, the lowest rates of addiction, the lowest rates of gang violence, literally every metric that was being guided by the war on drugs, once they ended their war on drugs in Portugal, and Portugal is a very, very small country, so they're still yeah. being affected by violence outside of their country in Spain and other places. Once that ended, once they ended that war on drugs, every bad metric plummeted, of overdoses, addictions, everything else. And that makes intuitive sense. As soon as we can treat an addiction like a health problem, which is what it actually is, chronic pain, PTSD, psychological issues, uh, trauma, everything else, once we treat it like the health issue it is, then we can actually treat the problem. Putting someone in jail or fining them and making their life harder and more difficult as a result, which pushes them even further to what they're addicted to, is obviously not working. If it worked, we wouldn't be having the opioid crisis. We wouldn't be having uh, cartels in Central America taking over entire countries. We wouldn't have governments that are being owned by drug gangs. We wouldn't have drug gang violence causing massive increases in, in murders over the past few years. It would be working, yeah. but it's not. So it's clearly not working. We need to go the other way. Yeah, and I, I certainly see the logic in that, and I, I too, uh, agree with you that just uh, locking people up for possession or use of drugs which are illegal is not really solving any problem. And in fact, it's costing right. the taxpayers a lot of money, and it's consuming uh, justice and law enforcement resources on something that's really not fixing a problem. I mean, that's that. I don't know that anybody goes into prison, for example, gets incarcerated without proper treatment for their addiction, and then comes yeah. out, and they're any different than they were when they went in. They're likely to to commit, I guess, what is now the same crime, which means we're we're going to consume more, use more money, consume more resources, more assets. To deal with that, they're actually so I agree with that. They're actually more likely. They're more likely to do it because now they have a criminal record. They can't leave the state. They can't get a business license. Their job, their life has been made exponentially more difficult. Not to mention the trauma they suffered in prison and having to learn to become hard just to be able to survive. And the thing is, when we talk about drug dealers, more often than not, it's not the kingpins that we see on TV. It's someone who is addicted and who is selling some of the product that that, that they have to use to hold their addiction in order to be able to afford to stay, keep their addiction going. So, yeah. you know, very often the even even going against drug dealers is really just going against addicts. They wouldn't be drug dealers if they weren't addicts. Yeah. I yeah, and I, I agree with you on that. I, I I think that's just a waste of, of time and money in a big sort of way. Yeah. Uh, with respect to that. So uh, some of your other political positions, let's kind of shift gears a little bit, that sure. are kind of high on your list, certainly from your personal perspective and the perspective of the Libertarian Party. Oh, uh, there's quite a few of them. Uh, I think right now we need to make sure that these ridiculous lockdowns or anything like it never happens again. Uh, we can. There are all sorts of things we can talk about. Getting government out of health care so that it can be affordable again. Uh, uh, getting government completely out of our right to keep and bear arms, which is no one's damn business. And the law says that. The Second Amendment says shall not be infringed. We can talk about uh, how government has completely botched education and how that needs to be put back in the hands of parents and teachers. There's all sorts of things we can talk about. But if the government has the ability Ability to tell you whether or not you're essential, whether or not you should be allowed to go outside, whether or not you should be allowed to work, whether or not you should be allowed to spend holidays with family, whether or not you should be uh, uh, have a decision in whether you should take a vaccine or not to put something. We're talking about you know putting things in your body. Whether or not you should be allowed to decide whether you can put something in your body. Until sure. we take away government's presumption and power to make those types of decisions, all these other things are, are arbitrary. They don't really matter because if the government can't even let you can tell you you can't even go outside, what does it matter if you have a right to keep and bear arms or a right to access health care uh, more more uh, affordably? You know, none of those yeah. things matter if the government is literally standing over you saying, no, you can't go outside. It's an emergency. 
it's a health emergency. And so I think right now, that's probably, I would say, the, the biggest focus that anyone who prizes liberty and freedom or really just prizes the ability to be able to thrive and live your life. Um, we need to make it very clear that under no pretext should government have the ability to tell people that they can't go outside. That's that's unacceptable. <laughs> if there were a virus that were so dangerous that it was a risk for anyone to even go outside, no one would have to tell us this. We wouldn't right. go outside. And as someone who went to, in the last year, I've been to over 40 states, I've come well within six feet of tens of thousands of people at well over or close to 200 events. I've been on something like 200 airline flights I've never caught COVID. I've been able to stay safe the whole time by washing and sanitizing my hands regularly. I don't touch my face unless my hands are clean. I don't get in every single person's face that I meet. I don't eat or drink after people. I used basic health and safety precautions, and I was able to stay clean the whole time. And the fact yeah. is the vast majority of people who are getting this virus are getting it because they're complying with these orders, which are basically <laughs> recreating the conditions for cold and flu season, where you stay in your house all the time unless you absolutely have to go outside with all the same other people that have to go outside at the same time and go into the same stores at the exact same time, all crowded together. This is the number one thing. Cool. They we got made a break it worse. And, and, no, I know. We got a break on us. Can you, can you hang on? I want to talk to you about some economic yes, stuff. Yes, absolutely. We got Spike yes, Cohen, absolutely. Libertarian VP candidate in 2020. Stay with us. We'll be right back. End of this segment. Spike Cohen, Libertarian vice presidential candidate in 2020, is our guest. So, with respect to a medical marijuana program, one of the objections, Spike, that folks who did not support 65, Initiative 65, was that mm -hmm. none of the taxes levied on the sale or really throughout the supply chain. Of, of medical marijuana flowed to the state. Those, those, those receipts, uh, those, those fees collected, if you will, were designed to fund the operation of the program through what the bill uh, dictated would be the Department of Health, Mississippi Department of Health there. So no money flowed into the general fund, if you will, as a result of that. Where do you stand on taxation of, of medical marijuana, and I, I'll, I'll kind of give you my take on it at first, uh, first okay. I should say, which is if, if, you, if you tax it at too high a rate, which is really what we've been seeing in California, I believe, so based on some reports I've read, is that the black market yep. continues to thrive. People just say, well, I ain't going to go pay the high taxes uh, to uh, um, buy my, my pot, my, my weed uh, exactly. through the legal means. I'm just going to go to the black market. It's still alive and well where I don't have that taxation going on. That doesn't happen as much with medical because often it's covered by insurance, but the, yeah. the end result is the same. The costs go up as a result of, the, of the, the government taxing it. Now, I mean, I'm a libertarian. Libertarians believe that for a government to even consider itself legitimate, it needs to find a way to be voluntarily uh, funded just like the rest of us have to do. Literally every other organization on earth except for government is expected to provide more value than it takes in, in cost <laughs> and as a result yeah. be able to thrive, except the government who gets to go around and threaten and extort all of us us to, to pay for its funds. And then we're shocked when we when we get bad treatment from, from an organization that doesn't have to actually prove any value to us. Putting that uh, philosophical and, and macroeconomics argument aside, um, like I said, again, I don't, I don't know enough about the specifics about how the funding happens on this bill uh, to yeah. be able to, to weigh in on that. But I would say in general, uh, the idea of taxing something so high that a black market is still preferable, which, like you said, we have seen in places like California. We've seen where in places like Illinois. Where recreational pot is legal, by the way. In California, where recreational is legal. Yeah. Where recreational is legal. Now, contrasting that, in Oklahoma, where the taxes are very low, uh, we see a thriving legal cannabis market there, and the black market is almost completely destroyed for cannabis. Um, yeah. So, yeah, no, the taxes need to be as low as possible for it. And, and especially for a medical thing, why are you taxing medicine? This is something that people absolutely need, in some cases, to be able to survive. Why is the government taking their cut from that? Bad enough they're taking it from your income and your property and you know the food that you buy and everything else. Why are they taking it from medicine? Why is government taxing sometimes at 40, 50, 60 percent the cost of the things that you need to not die? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just to, to uh, let you know, in Mississippi, as a matter of fact, prescriptions are not subject to sales taxes, but medical marijuana 
uh, in accordance with 65 is actually <laughs> is actually subject to a, a fee, if you will, that is equal to our sales tax rate, but that money is is designated to cover the cost of operating the program because there clearly there there's some cost of to, uh, of operations as opposed to going into the general fund, which is where sales taxes in Mississippi right. go now, and then some of that, of course, is diverted back out uh, at the municipal level. Uh, but it's just my concern is that everybody says, well, let's just tax the ever-loving snot out of it. Well, okay, well, then you're going to have a thriving black market. And, you, right, you know, you exactly. make a point that in- insurance would cover it, so maybe not as much in medical marijuana. But even if insurance covers, covers it, well, then our insurance rates go up. Uh, so you exactly. have that it, effect it, as well. Inclu- and, it, and that means it goes up because it's a pooled rate. It's going up for people who aren't That's using right. medical cannabis That's as right. well as people that are using medical cannabis. That's not fair to anyone. Why not instead say, why does the government need to be in charge of implementing this? I mean, w- yeah. weed has been for sale very actively and has not even had to have advertisement for it without any government involvement. In fact, even with the government saying you'll go to jail if you use it, weed is incredibly popular. So there's no right. reason to think that government needs to manage medical cannabis. Get rid of the fee. Just let the market handle it. Let providers provide the service and the and, and the, the product here, in this case, the, the medical cannabis, and keep government out of it. Why, why is the taxpayer having to pay for any of this. Yeah, I and yeah, so I, I just think there's it's it's a balance there that's got to be struck. But while we're talking about taxes, are are you familiar with the tax reform legislation that is being promoted and championed by our Speaker of the House, Philip Gunn, which uh, seeks to phase out our income taxes here in Mississippi over a period of time based on achieving certain certain metrics, certain triggers, uh, but it does in fact slightly raise sales tax on some items, but on food, it actually reduces it. Uh, what's kind of your feeling about income taxes, consumption taxes, and, and again, if you're familiar with this particular bill, uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm not familiar with the particular bill, but I can speak in general about different types of taxes. The reality is all taxation is an act of extortion. So whether we're talking about extorting your income or extorting you every time that you go and buy something that you need or want, or whether we're talking about taxing your property, which is basically a rent, uh, a perpetual rent on something you supposedly already own under the threat that they'll take it from you at any time that you're (laughs) unable to pay for it. any kind of tax is an act of extortion. Now, if, yeah. if I have to say that I have to choose between one type of extortion over another, a consumption tax in theory at least allows you to choose whether or not you want to consume that thing uh, or whether you want to maybe buy it online from a state where it's cheaper or something like that or go <laughs> somewhere else to buy it. But in everyday practice, the reality is you can't leave the state to a lower tax state every time you want to buy something unless you live you know, right on the border with a lower tax state. So, yeah. you know, is it preferable to income, uh, to an income tax? Again, it would depend on exactly what it is. I live in the Myrtle Beach area where we have very, very low taxes on everything except for our sales tax, which is through the roof because we're largely unloading our cost on tourists that come here. But even I then, gotcha. when I go to buy something, when I go to, you know, go to, uh, you know, uh, go to a uh, theater or go to a show or, you know, buy something at the store or whatever else, I'm still yeah. paying that rate as well. So I, I don't see any reason why government shouldn't be made to do what literally everyone else has to do. Come up yeah. with voluntary funding to be able to fund the things that they're saying that we need, which forces them to live within their means. And then you got the other extreme. You got Liz Warren and, and the far left wing of the Democrat Party who are championing uh, taxation of unrecognized gains on, on your assets, on so-called wealth tax. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the, so, you know, in general, I Democrats have never there found on that something one. that they... Yeah, no, I listen. The, <laughs> every time I get frustrated at Republicans for, you know, saying that, you know, they want a smaller government and then continuing to push for more government, then I remember what were the, the Democrats are like. <laughs> and I get equally frustrated because at, although at least with the Democrats, they don't try to pretend that they're trying to limit government. They straight That's up true. are saying you don't have a right to your money. You don't have a right, right to what you've earned. We actually have more right to it. You know, as Obama said, you didn't build that. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, taxation. 
All of this is the idea that you don't own what you have in any real way. That government can simply take it from you if they decide they need it. They'll let you hold it in the meantime, but if they decide they need it, they're just going to take it from you. That comes yeah. from their ability to extort you in the first place. And you know whether it's through a voluntary uh, a fees for services, whether it's through a uh, voluntary transaction fee where you can choose whether or you, not when you buy this phone, whether or not you want to pay the 5 or 10% fee to get protection on it in case something happens from government uh there needs to be a way for government to voluntarily be funded and by doing that that ends all the other problems we see in government because everything that government does every abuse they have stems from the fact that they ultimately aren't held accountable because they can just keep taking money from you they don't have to prove that they're providing you any real value so we need to look at voluntarily funded government which would in inevitably inevitably and necessarily be a much smaller government who is only doing what it really should be doing in the first place which is protecting your life, your rights, and your property. And that's it. They're not good at anything else. They're not even all that good at that, but they're definitely not good <laughs> at anything else. Yeah. I, you know, I, I, I got to say it to a great extent. I'm in line with you on that. Raising taxes and giving away that money, just filtering, giving away, that's easy. Creating value, that's hard. That, that exactly. requires creativity and innovation. That's what we had to do in the private sector, or you fail. Yep. You go yep. bankrupt because yep. uh, the market dictates exactly. that, determines that, and and government doesn't have that fear. I mean, they don't go to bed at night thinking, how am I going to make payroll? They don't have to worry about that. Exactly. So <laughs> exactly. they just wake up and saying, then we see how they use it. I can get elected. Exactly. Let me see. And then we see how they use it. They turn around. More. <laughs> Last year. We saw the largest transfer of wealth from those with the least to those with the yep. most. Trillions of dollars in debt yep. that we'll have to pay off for the next 40 years because they could. I agree. I totally agree. Spike, it's been a pleasure having you. Really enjoyed the discussion. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, and we'll talk soon. Good luck to you, my friend. Thank you. Join me in Tunica this weekend, mslp.org. Spike Cohen, Libertarian Vice Presidential Candidate in 2020, has been our guest on the JT Show.